Hey everyone, it's been a while and we have a new roundtable discussion series with a bunch of new faces to discuss. Um, well, except for mine, mine is old, but um, <laughs> welcome to a, a reprisal episode of Tales from the Goth Side. And we are going to be talking about intergenerational perceptions on diversity and inclusiveness and just experiences in the scene. Um, so let's get started introducing our roundtable panel of guests, starting with, um, I guess that's technically my right, Arthur, you want to introduce yourself? Name, generation, location, pronouns, and what got you into goth? Uh, my name is Arthur. Um, location is Tampa, Florida. Pronouns are he, him. Age, I think you said we're supposed to do our generation on that one. Um, yeah, do generation. I am either a millennial, a really young millennial or a really old Gen Z. It depends on what BuzzFeed article puts the cutout for it as. <laughs> <laughs> and what got me into the scene, I really don't have a good answer for that one. I like to tell people it's because I used to cry in graveyards when I was a child. That was kind of downhill from there. But I don't know. I heard the cure on the radio when I was in middle school and thought it was dope. Yeah, that's legit. Uh, next, Anthony. Hello, my name is Anthony. Um, my generation would be considered older Gen Z. Yeah, 2000 births are pretty murky. And... Um, uh, what was the next one? Sorry. Uh, locations, pronouns, and what got you into the scene? All right. Location, California, Los Angeles, California. And my um, pronouns are he, him, his. And what got me into the scene was a mixture of the internet, particularly watching goth YouTubers and developing this interest in the scene and doing a lot of research into the scene because I was really interested in it. I always saw a lot of goth characters and it just went from there. And it was just a sense of admiration for their dark appearance. And when I found a lot of the music like Lycia and whatnot and The Cure, Susie, it just drove me home for what I would believe to be um, my future or where I am right now. Nice, Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse. I am in California, uh, she, her, and I am also murky in between a young Gen X and an old millennial, uh, depending on the mood, depending on the topic. It might lean one way clearly. <laughs> and um, what got me into goth was literally a bunch of people say, you know, you need to do this. Let's go. We're going to find it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you need to do this. Literally. <laughs> Robin? Hello, I'm Robin. I am in San Diego, California. And my pronouns are she, her. And I am Gen X. And what got me started, probably college radio and nice. yeah college radio college radio at UCSD that's where it began for me that's really cool all right and then Azzy you want to introduce yourself yes um I'm Azzy I am a millennial right down the middle um in central Florida it's Florida somewhere and my pronouns are they them theirs what got me into the scene is well um, bargain bin CDs. And I picked up uh, Sisters of Mercy and Susie and the Banshees. And uh, honestly, I thought I hated music and I just kept trying a bunch of different things. And then I found Sisters of Mercy and I was just like, no, I love music. And what kind of store has Sisters of Mercy in a bargain bin? I can only find like best hits of Buddy Holly. <laughs> it, it was, um, it was like it was it's a store up in uh, Wisconsin where I'm from um, called Half Price Books. It's this chain and uh, it's just a used book CD and movie store. Mm. And um, they would have all of these like uh, project records and 4AD and Cleopatra. And eventually, you know, like you start picking up on the labels and I just started buying shit off these labels. And um, I liked the cover of um, Floodland. I was like, oh. This, this looks soft and nice and sweet. That's how I would describe Sisters of Mercy, right? <laughs> A very sweet band indeed. <laughs> um, and for some reason, at the, I think it just happened to be, um, you know, coincidence at the time, a lot of 
uh, goths, I, I think were just needing money and so selling off their whole CD collections. Um, so they were, there was a ton of shit at, at these stores. And I found another one like out in this other town um, nearby. And yeah, I think that just a bunch of goths were just like, you know what, fuck it, I need cash. I have everything on MP3, I'm gonna sell all my CDs. And I'm just like, yes, give me. <laughs> so it worked out. Um, so let's get started uh, straight into the conversation. Now the introductions are over and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with um, something that Anthony brought up in our kind of uh, pre-show discourse that no one else is privy to except for us, and that is first club experiences. I I think that that is actually a really really great place to start. And um, Anthony, do you mind telling your story again? Yeah. So my first clubbing experience was in Orange County, uh, which is like adjacent to Los Angeles. So it was at this place called Bat Cave Orange County, and it was called The Circle. I no longer frequent that place, but since this was my first experience, I will shed a little bit of light. So I wanted to go out, I wanted to go clubbing. This was when I was 18 years old. My mom was like, no, you can't do it without a friend. So I told a long story about how my friend was going with me. We were gonna be there, we were gonna lift back took a lift all the way out there, was the first one out there waiting outside. And I was just excited. And it was really, it was warm, but it was like getting colder. So I was like, come on, come on, come on, let me in. But once I finally got in, it was just, it was like coming into a new place. It was this feeling of being somewhere that wasn't familiar, but it was a little bit intimidating because I was what you would call, I wasn't as unexperienced as most people, but I was experienced enough to where I didn't look like, stand out like a sore thumb. And what happened was I saw people with like cyber locks. I saw people like with corpse paint, some people wearing like, like old fishnets, like Bauhaus t-shirts uh, shredded and like skirts and whatnot. I was just like, oh, wow. I really, I really feel as though I do belong here, but at the same time, I could do better. But it was just really hearing um, Sisters of Mercy on the dance floor and she passed away. And just at the beginning, Bauhaus was just playing. Uh, Bella Lugosi is dead. And it, it just felt like home. It felt like home, even though I'd never been there before. And I made a lot of friends there, some of which I will probably see again at the end of June, right? But it was, to sum it up as a whole, it was romantic. It was beautiful. It was something that I can't buy in a store, but I could experience by just <clears throat> hanging out with people. So what I would have to say is I really loved it and I wouldn't trade it for anything else. All right, who wants to go next? Anyone can jump in. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call on you. Sure, I'll go, I guess. So my first club experience is actually more of a concert experience. And it wasn't especially a goth concert. Well, for some context, there was this small venue called the Rock Bar in Daytona. It no longer exists. But about every week they would have a show and I would go every every week's show. And I remember there was this one set by a band called Machines on Blast, another band called Misfit Toys. They're local Florida bands. They're sort of industrial goth metal they're in that kind of a genre sphere so they're not your traditional bat cave stuff they're more on the industrial side and i went and i dressed myself all the way up my frilly black shirt and pale makeup and all that and went there it was just a great experience um it was the music that really got it for me that sensation of being in a place where the music is blasting and everyone is dancing even though it was more of a concert venue people did dance at it soon after that i started going to the castle in tampa which was a three-hour drive there and a three-hour drive back which i would do every night and that one was more of a dancing club. And I really just, that clicked immediately. And I knew I wanted to go to those clubs like for the rest of my life, basically. And it was so fun dressing up. It was so fun that community experience of everyone dancing to the same song just really hit different. Something really unique and special. I was uh, 18 I when I started going to those. Oops. Sorry. Sorry, I thought you were done. I was too, sorry. <laughs> so for me, it was this young adult nightclub called Stratus in Spring Valley, which I mean, was kind of in the middle of nowhere for me. And 
it was a combination of new wave and synth pop and goth and all of us were into MTV at the time heavily and uh so we would basically converge on this young adult nightclub and it was interesting because we didn't think about the business aspect of it we didn't think at that age oh well how are they making money because they're not selling drinks right so they would sell soda water hot dogs and they would charge three dollars cover and we were just going for the experience but it's just funny thinking back on it now because I don't know how they made money, <laughs> but um, it's interesting. So there was a mixture of the real new wave music at the time and then the goth and the convergence of it together. There was nothing else like this in San Diego at all. This is where all the kids went. And I'm pretty thankful. If you if you actually do a search of Stratus nightclub, you'll, I don't know. Jesse's probably seen the videos. I don't know if all of you have seen them, but um, it, it's it's pretty incredible that the footage that is on there. So that is my first experience in San Diego. I'm gonna have to look. Which neighborhood is that in? It's San Diego, but it, it was called Spring Valley. Um, oh. But it's it's San Diego. Do do we still have a culture of young adult clubs, like underage clubs, anymore? I didn't know that even existed. I, I, knew, it, I knew it did at one point. I I haven't heard of one in a long time I had one in the 90s yeah that was my first legit clubbing experience it was a young adult yeah. i think you had probably like 15 or maybe 14 to get in yeah because we had one in um in the 2000s um up where you know like two hours away from where i lived in wisconsin and that's that only lasted for a few years after i became aware of it but i i don't know if any any more that exist i don't know yeah. if that's a good or bad thing that, that we don't have those anymore yeah <laughs> Out there clubbing. Right. So let's hear your story, Jesse. Come on, tell us. <laughs> kind of like yours. It was definitely a going home kind of experience. But mine was really different than yours because, like, you had done all this research on the internet of, like, this is goth stuff and I'm just loving it more and more. And now I get to enter this goth space. I, I was at Buddy's Goth and my friends just being like, you need to go because that's what you are. And so the internet did have a club listing, like the international golf club listing was pretty current at that time. <laughs> um, you had to kind of know where to find things on the internet, but there there was a switchboard. And if you found like a major city golf page, then you would find some of those things. And um, so, yeah, so we went to this one place called Soil and thinking about inclusivity, I think uh, all but two of us were white and the white girls were Jewish girls, if that makes a difference to some people. And yeah, soil was incredible. It was like, it was the nineties and it was literally you walk in and there's people who are in propaganda and magazine and just looking beautiful and androgynous and just everything romantic. And of course you've got some trad we wouldn't say really trad at that point though. They were just like the older goss from the eighties. And definitely it was, it was just everything. It just felt so right. And everything was just black and bats and smoke and excellent. I think I might be the only one who didn't have like a super positive first club experience. I, uh, so the club, um, that I would go to in Wisconsin was um, called Club Anything. And I found out about it from my violin instructor of all people. Um, Cause she's just like, oh yeah, there used to be this place called Sanctuary Bar and then they moved and now they're called like Club Question Mark. I'm like, what the fuck is Club Question Mark? It's called Club Anything, but like their big sign outside just has like Club Question Mark. So, you know, it's, it's edgy, right? And I remember I went and I walked in the door and it's mid 2000s. So it's all like EVM and electro industrial. And I was super excited to be going to the goth club for the first time. It was the same situation, which is cold as fuck outside. And I wanted to go in and not be freezing to death. And I walked in and I was like, oh shit, I am a huge poser because if this is what's being played at the goth club, this is not what I thought was goth. Um, because it was like, it was that electro industrial and everyone was dressed in, um, you know, like, 
cyber gear and you know so with like yeah like the cyber locks and the fuzzy boot warmers and the giant ass trip pants and did i see anyone else dressed differently and you know a couple people dressed down you know like jeans and t-shirts and um i still feel bad to this day because i was sitting there alone grumpy by myself trying not to fall asleep because i had driven um an hour and a half two hours to go down to the club and this one guy came up and tried to talk to me and i was so standoffish because i was so like miserable that night and i feel bad to this day that i was not friendlier with him because he tried so hard to strike up a conversation but then i kept going back because um i started paying attention to it and they had um shows and stuff and i was like oh i like these bands so when it was like a band night um, for a band that I really enjoyed, like I go down and that was, that was my first experience of just like, this is, this, this is home. It just needed to be, I guess, a different holiday at home. Cause you know, the night makes a difference, but dancing to a band with the loudspeakers, having your ears blown out, being, having it be actually something, you know, that's, I don't know, it, it I don't want to say transformative experience because that sounds so cheesy, but it kind of really is. That's that's my first club. Ex- well, it's my first and couple after a club experiences. But Milwaukee has a good scene. I never got down to Chicago, though, because I hear that that's cool. But I, I always make a point when I travel to visit the goth clubs in different cities because they're always different. And it's always just like a completely different culture in each and every single one, even ones in, you know, like a relatively like similar area. And I think that that's amazing. But I also suspect that it might be a bit detrimental because everybody gets a little insular. So some clubs might be more like younger folks. So for example, here in Florida, out in Miami, um, you have a couple of clubs and some of them attract all of like the the Gen Z goths and then the millennials. And then there are some that are pretty much exclusively, you know, Gen X and boomers. And there's not a lot of like intergenerational mixing, which I find really odd because I know that there are people um, across all ages and um, across all groups, especially um, in in Tampa. Arthur, have you seen this in Tampa? What have seen what? Um, like at the castle, like there's a bunch of younger people and a bunch of older people. But yeah, it's, it's I think it, the castle spans generations pretty well. Yeah, but do you ever see people interacting? Yeah, all the time. Okay. Like I was. Um, there last night actually and I was obviously young-ish and I ended up dancing with a bunch of older guys there and we had conversations there was a group of three guys who were together and all of them were wearing smith shirts and that was weird but they decided that we were friends so we interacted <laughs> all right because um my last experience at the castle is I saw you know mostly the younger people were kind of grouping with themselves and and not really interacting with the rest of the club that might be true on most fronts. I'm a very social person, so I kind of go out of my way to talk to people, which might be why I have a different experience. Ah, uh, that's completely fair. I am I pretend to be a social person. <laughs> Here in San Diego, we mix. We all mix together. All of us. Young, old, all of us. Yeah, definitely. At all the clubs, for sure. So there isn't, like, that kind of self-segregation, self, self like... Yeah. Yeah. I think... Uh, I think as time's gone on, Mm -hmm. I, I, in the last, something I've noticed in the last, I'd say three years, three to five years, it's really, it's really changed as far as the scene in San Diego. Um, I feel like, uh, it's hard to explain. I feel like it's still a little clickish in that way, but I think also it might have something to do with me as a promoter and a DJ at the clubs mm-hmm. because you know how it is. We, 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 we literally go up to people and we bring people together. That's, right. that's part of what we do. So it's part of the job description, I feel like absolutely. I'm a catalyst to bring people together and that's what I try to do and I think it's super important bringing in the new blood because without the new blood we're not going to continue I'm not going to be doing this forever um and so when you bring in the new blood you got to mix the new with the old and 
it, it just flows. And so I, I think it's I'm more now than ever. Yeah. Found that at Batcave, a lot of it was like older and a little bit of the in between, and then a little bit of the young ones. And a lot of us were just hanging out together, most of which some of them basically knew each other already. And there was one moment where I was like dancing on the floor and because they used to get really packed, you would sometimes bump into somebody. And it's like, sometimes you have interactions with people regardless of who you are, where you're from. And I do think that in some cases, like there was this one club that I went to called uh, Helter Skelter versus Coven 13. And it was a lot of the uh, older bats and a lot of the um, Gen X and millennial bats. Um, a it wasn't as many as I would think being younger, maybe there were like one or two people that were around my age, but most of them either left a little bit earlier or didn't stay for very long. I would have to say that most of them, they hang out with their friends or they don't think you're gonna stay for very long. It's kind of like you have to root yourself in for them to really, really think about holding on to you as a friend or interacting with you, I, if that I, makes any sense. No, that, that's actually a really great point. Because after a while, you know, when you've seen so many faces rotate through the club, you think like, do I want to put my energy into interacting with every single new face? Or should I wait until I've seen them a couple of times and I know they're going to keep coming back and then invest energy? Yeah, it's something along that line. And it really depends on how the nights are structured. If they're like 18 and up, maybe I can go. If they're like 21 and up, it's like, that won't be an issue in a few months, but it can kind of affect how we see as many people. Because I think the age requirement may be like a factor for what many um, consider. Mm. I just thought of something. This is, it's, it's kind of cliche, but the difference between a huge venue and a small venue, I mean, if, if you're in a if you're in a venue that has a capacity let's say of 100 max right and you're you're really up against each other you're more inclined to talk to someone right yeah, yeah. versus versus if if you're totally spread out and there's like 350 400 people it it just seems like the more intimate well actually it could go one of two ways if it's more intimate you're more likely to interact. If it's more crowded, you're likely to interact. So I, I guess it could be, wow, okay. No, that's, <laughs> it could be about no, you're actually right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, like uh, since I was at the castle last night, it was very, very packed for some reason. I think it's because of everyone here from Memorial Day weekend, maybe, but it was uh, right everybody back to back and stuff. And everyone was forced to interact whether they liked it or not. I also noticed that everyone was forced to force to mingle more, like everyone couldn't separate the different corners. So the younger people and the older people were right against each other, whether they liked it or not. So there was that forced interaction. Hmm. Interesting. Because yeah, I do. I do find that a lot. It was basically when standing on the dance floor and you were like shoulder to shoulder with somebody and you were trying to do an intricate dance, but you both do the same move and you touch arms and you're both like saying, hey, hi, whatnot. And they wouldn't fault you for wanting to move to another end or basically move back to get some space. Or in some cases, both of you guys leave to get some fresh air and you guys start talking a little bit. That's a so, really good point. I do, I mean, honestly, at clubs, I do most social of my socializing uh, with the smokers. And the smokers tend to be older folks, so that's probably on me. <laughs> I just realized that. You know, once yep. I quit smoking, you you just hit the nail on the head because once I quit smoking, I didn't interact as much. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Shit. Jesse, you were gonna say something? I oh, know you're just so making me realize how antisocial I am. Like, <laughs> like the 
patio is a great place if you actually want to talk to people and meet people. Like the patio is a great place and just sitting on the side sometimes. Um, I guess I do meet most people on the dance floor, but I guess I'm usually meeting people and I tend to dance a lot and then I'm already meeting people there. So then I guess I'm not really so much meeting people unless they're coming up to me. Do you but know? oh sorry, go ahead. But as far as ages go, I think I think for myself, I actually tend not to go to places that are 18 and up if it's a dance place, um, if it's a show or or something like that, then that's another story. But if it's just a dance night, for a long time now, I've tended not to go to 18 and up ones. But um, at a 21 and up spot, I think I think in general, LA doesn't really care. And pretty much everywhere I've gone doesn't really care. I kind of think it's a little weird for myself personally to go out and um, into a party environment uh, where people uh, aren't of legal age to drink. <laughs> I, I think that can get um, a little bit weird and there's no reason for it i mean at the castle i think um arthur the castle is 19 and up right 18 and up i believe 18 and up and they put big old x's on people's hands um for when they can't drink but um i guess it's for me i'm it's probably because i rely on alcohol as like a social crutch be just like now i can talk to you i've had two drinks let's have a conversation um so i don't know why that's weird yeah, I might just be antisocial like Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> but do have you guys ever found um, any difficulties speaking with people who are a lot older or a lot younger than you? Like having that sort of difficulty connecting even in that shared environment of, you know, you love the music and you love the club? Honestly, not really. I found that a lot of my friends that I've made in the clubs are in their 30s. Uh, one of my good friends is named Dean and he's in his 50s or so. So I found a, a lot of us enjoy the same music from that era of the 80s. And a lot of people of different ages can enjoy that same core music. So if you base it around that core music or a love of the modern music as well, like I made people friends around the modern post-punk scene, that's an automatic shared interest that transcends age, I've found. Yeah, I do agree with that, that the music does transcend the age boundary because I find with a lot of people in like uh, scenes, especially music groups is usually when they start listening to a band, it's always like, there's always this sense of questioning that comes in like, um, comes in like, oh, when did, where did you hear them? Like, um, there's always this curiosity that is sparked. And I always like interacting with um, people who are a little bit older because it's like you guys get to share these experiences like oh I really love this song and then I hear from them like oh I used to hear this song on the radio a lot and it's and you guys are sharing this nostalgic moment even though you guys weren't in the same place at the same time mm. I, yeah I, I like that you both um sort of enjoy that because I've run into people who are younger than me who I get I get really animated and excited uh, when I talk about music, especially with a band that I really love. And sometimes I find that if I go a little bit too deep into talking about it and like, oh, I remember when this album came out and this one, uh, it, they, they, I feel like um, people sometimes get really, uh, sometimes it's exciting, like it's shared excitement, but other times like I've, I felt people be just like, what do you think of me? The fact that I don't know like this other album for this band that I also really enjoy, like kind of a defensiveness. I have a small anecdote to share kind of on the subject. I remember I went to the I bar a while ago in Orlando and it was 80s night, but 80s night is also just kind of like half goth there. That's just kind of how it is. Yeah. And I was dancing and then a Madonna song came on and I got off the dance floor because I wanted a break. And this old guy like walked up to me and he started this whole rant about like how I was too young to appreciate true 80s music and Madonna and stuff like that. And I just remember that because like, what the, I was like, what the hell, man? He... I was that is afraid to come off as that person. There, I found that there is some gatekeeping that I've seen. Of, like, we've all met this, like the, el the elder goth who was actually there in the 80s. And it's kind of sort of defensive of the music as if they own it, if that makes sense. Right. So that's that's what I'm trying to say is like sometimes I feel like when I get too deep into talking about like um, a band that I really enjoy that someone might feel like I'm coming off that way. 
um, or that like the next thing that they expect out of my mouth is, um, can you name the the bassist and the exact technique that they used on this song on this album? You know, something I'm on the other end of that because I'm always worried that in conversation they're going to drop those questions on me. I have a completely different perspective. All right. So. I worked at 91X for many years here in San Diego. And what ends up happening is people will come up to me and they'll say, I used to listen to you in elementary school. <laughs> I used to listen to you in high school. I used to listen to you in college. You know, I'd be answering the phone at the radio station and people would call up, yeah, my grandparents used to listen. I mean, just so. <laughs> When I, when I go out to the clubs or when I'm doing, you know, Sabbath Ascension, whatever it is, it's kind of the same thing. A 21 year old will come up to me. Yeah, my dad used to listen to you on the radio. And so it, it's actually a good thing. It, it, I don't see it as a negative. I don't take, take it as, oh, I'm old. I, that's not what I, I see it as. I see it as more of we're all together and we're sharing these experiences and I'm so thankful that you were there to hear me and that I was there to provide this musical history for you on the radio all these years and the club. So it's, it's, it's a different thing for me. It's a different perspective. That is such a cool impact to have. That's really cool. Yeah. 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 That's yeah that cool. is next cool, like alternative station too. that. It's in San Diego and Mexico. Mm -hmm. I used to listen, Robin. <laughs> uh, that reminds yeah. me of um, a DJ that we had in Honolulu. She would also DJ on um, college radio and had been doing so since like the 80s. And yeah, everyone knew who she was. And, be, and I do remember people saying like, oh yeah, I've been listening to her show, A Feast of Friends since, you know, like, college or high school or that sort of thing and that's that's such a really cool tangible experiential way to have that cross temporal influence and impact on people yeah know, I think that's, that's, amazing. Why, that's why you know mixing when you were talking about the young versus the older i i think that the people it, it, it's especially obviously in San Diego, or I mean, it could be in any city, but for me, San Diego, because I've been here since I was 15 years old. So um, when the people, when I see the people at the clubs, I, I, I almost want to just, you know, grab them and hug them and, and just say, you know, thank you. Just thank you for, for being here. Thank you for bringing your experiences into this venue and because like i said earlier we can't keep continuing without the new people and i think it's super important that we let the younger people know that i let the younger people know like you're important to me it's important that you're here because this can't happen without you and you know at the same time sharing what i know with, with them and um, as I've gotten older, I've actually come out of my shell more and I'm willing to share more because I'm more comfortable in my own skin. Um, I used to be, you said antisocial. <laughs> I, I used to be, I would call myself a social introvert. You know, I'll be out there in the club it gets to a point where I got to go unless it's my night then I can't leave and I'll go home and I'll need to regroup and I'll need to recharge. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us are like that. Yeah. That's, that's why whenever I have a night, I always bring along a second person so that I can fuck off when I need to <laughs> be just like, I need to just go outside and just <sighs> having all the fun, but I just need a moment. You know, that's that whole social introvert thing, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, at least here in central Florida, yeah, we have the castle that has like um, a good mix of 
uh, younger people, but like um, in Orlando, um, the regular clubs there mostly tend to age much, much older. So Ibar Arthur is now Barbarella's. Yes, I saw that. I've got to get used to the name change, not dead name them anymore. <laughs> um, but that's definitely an older crowd. Um, I've been to mannequins that skews older. There's the Falcon when they have like their their synth pop eighties night, and that brings out a lot of younger people who just want to dance to it. I've not heard of that one. Mode. Oh, it's called um, Uberbahn at the Falcons. It's run by Nick Mariano. I'll Google that. Yeah, he does. He does great stuff, and I see a lot of younger people out of that. But it's like a throwback sort of synth pop night. So it's kind of weird where where, where folks show up, and then the nights that I that um, I've done um, with Obscure and Dead Like, it's always a mixed bag on who comes, and I'm not really sure why. Don't you think it also has to do with how old the club night is? In 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 what sense? Well, like, for example, Club Sabbath, it started in 1998. Mm -hmm. So the people that were there from the beginning in 1998, a lot of them have gotten married or had kids or whatever it is, and they're not necessarily going anymore. And they'll come out once in a while. But there are some that have been coming since 1998. Mm -hmm. Right? So I've been that's why I think. Yeah, the, the clubs that have been there the longest, I think, have more of, this is just an observation here in San Diego, more, more of a wide age range. Um, it's, it's not quite so um, clear cut, I think, at least in uh, Central Florida. I'd just say Florida is like one big scene because I travel all over it. But like, um, there's one bar that's newer, um, last two or three years in Orlando and that one ages older, but it's, it's run by older folks and the DJs are the ones who have been DJing since, you know, the nineties. So it might also be that, but like the nights that I run, it's, um, we don't have a, a set space, but our crowd also tends to skew older. Um, unless we're DJing like by the college, then we'll get younger people out who just want to listen to Russian post-punk, which is great. Love Russian <laughs> post-punk. Yeah. CD um, by yeah. Like one thing we've we've found is it depends on how our flyers look. If they look like a really bad two thousands flyer, we're gonna mostly get older older crowd. But if it's something that looks say like um like a Luna Negra um flyer or a Yami Spechi flyer or something that like looks throwback but like modern, then we'll get a younger crowd. Hmm. That begs the question, do you have all three to get everybody coming? <laughs> Somehow combine everything? I don't know. I think the secret is uh, what Robin was saying, and that's uh, talking to people and making sure that everyone feels welcome, and then they tell their friends. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry if you can hear my stomach growling. I just realized it's really loud, and I can even hear it through the headphones. Holy shit. <laughs> so my apologies if you can. Oh, no worries. We all have a monster inside our beds. I'm sorry for being human. I'm a bad goth. I need to be immortal. <laughs> Just drink the blood of the youth. You'll be fine. That's what I do. Are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> That's how to say it in that case. I do have a little story to share that just built on my mind. So again, last night I was at the club. I've said that about 5 million times so far. And I was dancing with someone who was older than me, either in his 50s or 60s, clearly age, gray hair, all of that. I don't want to just say old guy over and over. But he came up to me and he said, how old are you? And I, before I could answer, he goes, you're so young. And then he like waved to me and then walked away. And I've been thinking about that because like the way he said it was sort of not in a condescending tone, but more of like an appreciative zone, like a surprise. Like, like wow, young like people excitement? are still- Yeah, like excitement. Like, wow, young people are still enjoying this. So I was wondering if anybody else had similar experiences, either being the young person that everybody loved was there or being on the older side and being really happy that younger people are still coming out. Young person that all the older people liked. Yeah. It's like, oh, really? Wow, you're so young. Like, how did you, uh, how did you find the music? How did you become a part of it? And I'm like, uh, 
Yeah, I found the internet. I yeah, the internet. The, yeah, Susie, whatnot. Um, <laughs> Bauhaus, Helter Skelter, Skeletal Family, Switchblade Symphony. Yeah, that's that's so funny because um, my uh, uh, DJ partner um, Mouse, she and I will see someone somewhere and be just like, oh my god. It's 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 young people and they're so adorable and we're so excited that they're out and we're not going to talk to them because we get super shy. Oh no! We're just, no bite. I know. So then, what usually happens is we get a couple more drinks and then we track them down. And we're just like hi, and then at that point, we're just <laughs> not quite level, you know. <sighs> That social introversion again, damn it! But I I get so excited um, when I I see um, younger people, and sometimes I have to ask like people around me like, do I know that person? Do I know that person? Do I know that person? And fortunately, people know who I know, so they're just like, no, no, yes, as you know that person, because I'm face blind, I don't recognize people. Um, and then and then I try to like gain up the courage to go talk to them because it's so exciting so exciting but you know what i think is really important to ask people especially the younger people how they found out about your night mm -hmm. and that way you know yeah. right so usually what i hear is through a friend not through facebook not through instagram not through but from a friend. And that's why I think it is super important to acknowledge people and work through that social anxiety <laughs> that we sometimes have. And I, I think I'll always have a little bit of that, but I, I just, I really work on it. And it's funny you mentioned the, the drink thing. That is definitely true. Um, but I'm trying to work on it without that as well. Yeah. And it's challenging. It, it really is. Um, I never would have, I've never would have guessed uh, that, that that is something that's challenging for you because you're so sociable right now. And I, I mean, I guess you could say the same about me, but it's, it's a real thing, you know? That's why I was on the radio. <laughs> That's actually, that's a good point. Worst you got to deal with is phone calls. Um, so that's cool. I'm glad no one here feels weird about, you know, people who are older than them or younger than them because um, I, I've definitely heard like that concern expressed before, but it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Um, but. Well, I should probably make a confession after that. Uh-oh. <laughs> So when I was a baby bat, I did see, I was probably like 18, maybe 19 at the time. And there was this one older guy that my friend and I would call um, an elder and we would call him Sisters of Mercy. That was the club name that we gave because he was always in the Sisters of Mercy shirt. So he was that cliche. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, literally she and I had this moment where we looked at each other and we were just like, we're not golf clubbing when we're his age. But now I am. <laughs> that's that's interesting. So you actually like you thought to yourself, yeah, I'm I'm definitely gonna like age out of the, the club experience. Yeah. As wow. much as it felt right, as much as I loved it. Yeah. Like just, you know, life can easily take you a different direction and you're not in a club every weekend or every other night or every night like I was at one point. <laughs> San Diego is a good place to uh, be a goth because it has its own scene just about every night anyway, at least when I was there. And then if there was an off night, then it's like you just shoot up to LA or Orange County or you drop down to Tijuana or something and you get your bases covered. But um, yeah, I didn't think I'd do that like my whole life. <laughs> Um, I know we had, we were talking about it um, previously in a conversation we'd had before, but um, you were telling me that 
um, sort of the club makeup is different between like California clubs and like Tijuana clubs? Um, well, the clubs like is, that I would go to, um, Club A upstairs and uh, Porky's. And Club A upstairs was in this major tourist strip and it was not very inclusive. Um, but they had a goth friendly night upstairs. And um, so they made some exceptions for some people who fit that. And like, yeah, fit so, that they, how? so like the majority of the club was pretty much your typical like 18, 19, 20 year old, like college student, military member, just getting wasted, just sloppy wasted, dancing all night. And um, and it was very much an American crowd that that was for, even though it was technically in Tijuana. And um, upstairs though, they would let some Mexicans in and um, they, they did care, like if you were darker, lighter complexion and stuff there. I think Porky's was different. I think Porky's was really meant for the locals and um, they would let us Americans in though, if you found it. Interesting that um, there was a little bit of a coloristic aspect down there. Oh yeah. Do you find that, um, do you find that in the U.S. goth clubs as well? I've heard of it. I haven't really experienced it firsthand, um, but I've heard that at some spots things like that happen, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I heard a story that in Portland, Oregon, there's a lawsuit uh, going down for like one particular club and it was for uh, racial discrimination. And a goth club? a goth club but i'm lovecraft? kind of lovecraft no okay i think it's another one i have to check but i heard the story from a uh, goth friend who's moved out and down there and he's kind of questioning it a little bit i'm a little bit on the uh skeptical of if this is this really a goth club or is it like a new wave bar with a whole bunch of uh, pretentious people like um housing the bar, it's um, it's a little bit more of, once I hear something like this, I'm a little bit more, there's a lot of questions I have to ask. Who's involved? Um, what happened? What was the incident? And usually I think most people ask these questions because they take uh, their club spaces very seriously and they want everyone to have a good time and they don't want uh, anyone to feel that this is an indicative nature of the scene as a whole, but rather just these outlying people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know that there are some clubs that I will not go to because I do not feel that they are queer friendly, or I feel that they are um, very misogynistic. And while I am AFAB, I do not as, uh, identify as a woman, but I still get that misogynistic treatment and there are definitely places in Florida that I will not go because um, the vibe there just gets so weird. Yeah, because one uh, particular club that I mentioned before and um, not wanting to go there anymore as my first experience, I would say that it's more of a goth industrial club, but the owner was just ousted by um, his ex-girlfriend as uh, basically not being the person who he advertised himself to be like, being an open individual, being like queer friendly and basically having a record with the FBI. Yeah, it gets crazier, but I don't wanna to dwell too deep into it, but I want to basically put that out there that the that there is like an active FBI investigation against this guy and that at this point there is like there is a little bit of I'm waiting to see what happens next to see how things proceed forward but right now I'm kind of like distancing myself away from that for safety reasons and right. for 
um, for investigative reasons. Right. Well, what are what are all of your perspectives on whenever something like this does happen, even if it's, say, someone who's been doing events um, for 25 years and they get ousted, the first response that everyone has is, oh, he wasn't really part of the scene anyway, rather than, say, addressing yeah, I've seen that. that. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. Yeah. So what are your perspectives on that? Well, there's a one going on with a um, local, not local goth, there's a local goth event that happens about once a year. It's the Vampire Ball, if you've heard of it as Oh, a, yeah, with Father Sebastian. Yeah, with Father Sebastian. This that guy hosts it. has been public for years. I don't know. Yeah, it's been public for years. And it now. seems like it, it's not, but every few months, another video surfaces of some girl talking about her experiences with him mm-hmm. and another like huge Facebook drama unloads. And just nothing seems to happen. People just don't get rid of him for some reason. I almost feel like because goth is such a scarce culture in a way that people are reluctant to give up their icons, even if they do make, even if they are horrible people. Does that make any sense? Is he an icon? Hmm? Is he an icon, really? Um, Within the, like, the vampire side of the goth scene, yes. Within goth scene as a whole, not really. He's more of a subculture of a subculture type icon, but he organizes a lot of events. I'm not, just to disclaim, I'm not a fan of him at all. I think what he's done is disgusting and need to get rid of him his party felt different too it actually didn't like if you're going to say somebody's not really part of the scene right like the vampire scene and the and la goth scene are not the same scene like you will get overlap you can have overlap for sure but there are different worlds like even this is true even in the la goth scene like you can have so many different clubs and events that you know, like Anthony and I have never met in person. And that's very easy to like decide to do something else on a Saturday night. So like with this guy in particular, um, yeah, I I, I think that would be a stretch to to say he's a goth icon, but uh, but I get why people want the fangs. (laughs) But yeah, like as far as the parties go though, that's, now okay well that's guess a party i'm not going to anymore but it's kind of funny how times change how save me essentially but back in the 90s in tijuana i would enter a club that i consciously knew my friend might not get into simply because my friend is dark but my friend was willing to take the chance on getting in so i went in whereas like now it's like when we have conversations about where we're going to go my friends and i it's like oh we can't go there because they're not going to let so-and-so in because so-and-so's this way. And it's just like a no-brainer. Well, yeah, of course we wouldn't go there. So I think um, that just in my own little lifespan of nightlife culture and not really nightlife culture, but really just culture in general of, you know, taking a stand. And so, you know, maybe people forget about Father Sebastian's misogynistic ways that are alleged against him um but you know there's always somebody's first time that wants to go to a vampire ball so the conversation isn't necessarily not needed although it may be frustrating to have to repeat over and over yeah robin have you seen any shifts in perspectives for as long as um you've been uh, active or shifts in what people want out of um goth spaces in terms of inclusiveness in San Diego specifically? Yes, I think as time's gone on, it's definitely shifted, but taking for example, Sabbath, which Linda E. started in 1998, that was one of the very first clubs of its kind, along with Brian Pollard's clubs. Um, And Linda is lesbian. And so that was out there from the very beginning. And it's, it, it's always been inclusive to everyone. And I'm using Sabbath as an example because that never changed. But the thing I've noticed that has changed is people are more, hey, I'm this, hey, I'm that, this is me. They're, they're way more open to who they are and versus maybe before, they were a little more introverted about it. So that's what's changed to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, do you see yes. that as a good thing or or just like a 
all right, this is happening. I think it's incredible. <laughs> I think it's incredible. I think that, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have tons of friends that were in the closet, so to speak, for years. And now they're out and it's wonderful. I think, yeah, I think it's. I, I know exactly what you mean. I, I have some friends like that as well who they're older and they've they've always expressed themselves as how they are, but they never would say it or celebrate it necessarily in the way that, that they do now. And they just feel so comfortable doing that in, you know, goth spaces. It's become on another level, like more of a, you know, haven than it had been. Exactly. Yeah. And I think at least for San Diego and Los Angeles, a lot of goth spaces were traditionally gay spaces, kind of like, kind of like infamous gay spaces even. And I think just like the history of who has been going to actual goth clubs, it's the Batcave and stuff like that. You know, it's very intrinsic in the fabric of what has made this subculture. True, so true for San Diego. That is without a doubt. I mean, of, of the venues, if you think about the venues that Sabbath's been in, yeah. you know, Riches, and I mean, I could go on and on. Um, Numbers. Jesse, you, you hit it. You hit the nail on the head, so to speak. I would find that it's kind of what we've been seeing a lot, which is the newer generation are different than the um, generation that uh, was before it. And it it's showing itself in the scene for talks of inclusivity, I would have to say is, for me, it would have, I would rather have more people who are familiar with how to handle situations in uh, situations in which uh, that club owner where it was, where he was uh, misogynistic or in other cases where there's instances of colorism, I'd rather have somebody who is more familiar with how to handle this and how to provide a space where we can be proud that the goth scene welcomes everyone, regardless of where you come from, and not be a space to allow these individuals who hold these dangerous ideologies to make a space or a point in, in the um, scene or subculture as a whole. I know that in some cases, there's definitely the concern that, well, if we say something, then it's gonna split up our scene and then we're not gonna have a scene at all. If, if we call people out for misogynistic behavior, especially a DJ because gasp, if they stop DJing, we have nothing. Mm. Which is so fake. There's so many DJs out there that can cover yeah, and if and if there aren't any DJs, someone's gonna start doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just to, just to cover. I mean, I make the joke a lot that every goth's a DJ at some point in their life. Seems like it. I'm actually gonna start DJing. Ah! See. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even if it's just you make a Spotify playlist, I think that counts. Yeah. You're curating music for another person. Yeah, so I I know that in a lot of cases, like people make up, um, at least in my my opinion, people make up all of these bullshit reasons about why they can't call someone out or can't act um, in a way that creates more inclusivity or more safe spaces for people. And that's why like in a lot of cases, I am so happy for, you know, younger generations who are not afraid to say, this is what we want where we party. This is what we want in, in, in our, in our clubs, because a lot of times you find that just echoed by the older folks, um, not saying, you know, geriatric folks, but you know, just like the older generations as well. It's just for some reason, it, it, I feel like it just required a younger catalyst in some places and some spaces in order to make that happen. Yeah. I do, I do agree with that. And I think now that I've become part of the scene, I started 
well, I, now that I've became part of the more greater scene, I want to say, seeing as online has a catalyst for you to interact with many different groups of people, regardless of geography, mm -hmm. it's, you come across these people that make excuses. Like, for example, if you've heard about the Son Sombre incident. Who hasn't? Yeah, who yeah, hasn't? Yeah. In one of the, um, one of the bands that I've um, come across, they're still, um, they're still like praising Son Sombre for doing a cover of one of their songs. And I'm just like, uh, are, are you sure you want to do that? And it's basically seeing people go to um, the lead singer's defense, such as uh, one, one lady in the scene who basically starts saying, so we're going to cancel him over a witch hunt, but we're going to ignore the many people in the scene who have committed like um, sexual misconduct acts. Like I believe it was Andy from Bella Morte. And it's like, I seen this person just literally go out and say, well, 97% of men in the scene are like um, predators. And I'm just, it's a little bit shocking to hear this response from somebody when there's evidence logically pointing towards the fact that he has connections, but it's how do you respond to someone who's correct? There are some people in the scene that are predatory, but to justify the means on ends with another issue, if that makes any sense. Are you asking, like, how do you address the very real, say, more close to home problems in the same way that you address, say, being outraged about a band you've never met on the internet? Yes. Like, yeah, um, that's a I don't know how question. I'm putting it, but it's, it's somewhat the um, issue of, I think I was trying to address something earlier, I apologize. It was seeing people come to his defense and they're seeing the people that say, oh, he was, he wasn't a good band anyway, but it's like, he was still a goth, he was still part of like the goth subculture. Yeah, whether or not that was a good band isn't, isn't a question. Yeah, it isn't a question, but it's like, why are you still defending him even though the evidence is here? Like, what's the point? Right. And my perception on this, at least, is, is again, what I was saying is, is um, I think that a lot of people who have been in the scene for a long time have, and uh, myself included for a while, this is something that I had to confront in my own sort of perception, is that we have a scene of, of inclusivity and we would only include those who really belong. So if someone managed to get into the scene, well, then if we have to kick them out, then we did wrong by letting them in in the first place. And we don't want to admit that we were wrong. That's so, a good point. You know, instead mm -hmm. you, you uh, distance and it's easy to, to do that with like people that you don't know so well, but then, you know, there's the person you've been partying with for the last 10 years. And it's like, I, I think that it's just really hard for people to um, admit that they, you know, kind of seen this, had seen this happen and were, were part of it and didn't act on it or trusted this person. And people don't want to lose friends. No. Oh. I don't know. That's that's just been my perception. I don't have a good answer for you. Does anyone have a good answer? Good answer to what? Because that was kind of a long discussion. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's a would, lot to unpack, right? Yeah, it's a lot to unpack, but I think I need to sum it down to how do you respond to people who make excuses like the... I'm... I don't have a good way to answer that because that's the question, isn't it? Because on one hand, I want to have a zero tolerance policy. If someone's a sexual predator, I want them gone. I want them dead. Meanwhile, if somebody makes a small mistake, you, do you still apply the same zero tolerance policy or is there a level of forgiveness? It's yeah. hard to tell sometimes. Like if someone said something racist 20 years ago, do you immediately fully get rid of them? Do you forgive them? That kind of stuff is hard to decide. Yeah, hmm. Jesse, Robin, how have you guys had to deal with this? How have, and like, how have you handled that because there's always shitty people for mm -hmm. forever well, 
Yeah, I mean, a case by case basis. I don't think there's a one cut and dry answer for that whatsoever. So, you know, if there's someone that's been to the club that is making it difficult for someone else that's at the club, sometimes it has to do with their past relationship. Um, so people will bring things into the club that don't need to be brought in, right? Like yeah. this person used to date this person. Now they're both at the club. Oh yeah, She's interpersonal with her new drama. boyfriend. Mm -hmm. The new boyfriend's mad at the old boy. It, 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 so there's those situations where it, it's like, why are you bringing this into the club? This has nothing to do with the club. Yeah. You need to settle your issues out there. So, I, and I know that's a little off topic, but it kind of goes along with each individual thing has to be handled differently. And I'm sorry, but I'm not, no one's coming into my club with Nazi symbols or whatever. You know what I mean? So that, that's the thing. I mean, you got to just, it's case by case basis. Um, and then there's the people that will come in and they'll, they'll be wearing a, a, a Nazi thing and they'll, oh no, I'm just re representing the culture. So that opens up a whole can of worms, maybe with this discussion. You know, yeah, how, you're do right. you, how do you handle people that are wearing things that are offensive? And I know Jesse's done a lot of stuff on, on her Instagram about this. And so I actually want to hear her perspective on that. <laughs> um, I think that some things just really shouldn't be worn anymore today. Like, I don't care how old school punk rock you are. You just don't wear a swastika anywhere in the Western world in 2021. Um, I think that one of the things I'll say just kind of gener generationally, like what, what is a generation's fight? Like for Gen X, you know, it was very fighting against things. Whereas I would say today's youth, Arthur Anthony, <laughs> um, I think, you know, you're more about fighting for yourselves and your place in society and society more holistically rather than self-centered, even though you focus a lot on the self and putting yourself out there in the world. Um, kind of like how Robin was saying earlier of like, you know, this is, this is me and, um, and recognition of that. And so, yeah, so just like in so many different ways, I just don't think that, um, that it's okay. And even in the nineties, like when it came to some of the military inspired, Nazi inspired fashion and fetishism and stuff like that, that would enter into the clubs. Um, I understood that at the time, what, that it wasn't a pro-Nazi statement, but at the same time, it was not always uh, comforting to, you know, hang out with those people because sometimes you don't you don't know for that person is that um, more than your fetish or not, um, and just like how Robin was saying too about what comes to the club and doesn't come into the club, and kind of. What all of you have been saying, for, um, especially Azzy too, it's, it, you know, gatekeeping is important. And I think part of gatekeeping is, yes, there's going to be other people coming through the literal gates of whatever space it is, whether it's online or in an actual club, but there's going to be people who come in with um, strong opinions and stupid opinions, certainly counter opinions. And for myself, if I have any kind of duty as an elder cop, it would be, um, you know, not everything that's actually inside of a goth club is a goth person. And there can be regulars at goth clubs who are not actually goth people. So, yeah, I just... It's hard to say, you know, 
to put certain restrictions on dress code and, and all of that for club nights. But um, I think that some things just shouldn't be worn. Yeah, the I know that at one point, because there were some people who wore military uh, uniforms, specifically, um, it was like Nazi regalia without any of the symbols. So none of the symbols, but you know, still that style of uniform um, to the castle. Um, shit, this was like half a decade ago, maybe more. I've um, seen it more recently than that. Oh, because the castle got branded as a Nazi club at one point. What? Really? Oh, no. Yeah. It's, oh. It, it's it's because um it's that whole thing that happened with with punk you know some people might be subverting the subverting some aspect for um fashion or statement and then the actual nazis are just like it's our people oh no you know yeah and then you can't get them out once they're there yeah. they're there yeah like cockroaches <laughs> yeah i kind of have to debate with myself before i do posts like that because it does give a little crack for somebody to enter the door thinking that's a safe space for them to flash their symbolism which has uh the meaning that we don't want to promote but um military fashion definitely had its moment uh mm -hmm. in the 90s and early 2000s i mean we went, my friends and I, we would go to army surplus stores and different kinds of military surplus stores. Any chance that we got. I mean, how old is it? We still wear Doc Martens, right? Like like work boots and like those combat boots uh, style like shoes. So that's. Mm -hmm. Well, I do, I do want to say that I think that military fashion is okay. It depends on what it entails. Mm. Yeah. Right? I mean. Yes. It it just depends. Like, say if you're wearing like, um, particularly a military uniform, you don't want to get like World War II era stuff. Or yeah. Say if you're wearing a, a sergeant jacket, you probably want one from like, maybe a surplus store that isn't like, how do I put it? Like maybe the Cold War era of things or maybe post Cold War era, I don't know if that area is murky, but you don't want anything that screams, I generally love uh, hateful people, come here. You want something that says, I have authority, don't take away my authority, sort of thing. And this is the difference between what Jesse just said. This is the difference between 2021 and 1998. It's completely mm -hmm. different, completely. So, I hear exactly what you're saying, but that's not what we thought of in 1998. Mm. Yes. And I kind of noticed that a little bit uh, during some time periods that talk about the subculture or some media. For example, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Newgrounds or the whole flash era of uh, gaming, but there was this one game that talked about goths taking over a middle school and uh, Killing and hurting everyone. This was post Columbine. It was uh, Pico School, isn't it? That's the game. Yeah, Pico School, and it was made in um, right after Columbine in 1999. Mm -hmm. So, of course, of course, it's all very incorrect. And one of the characters in the hallway has like has swastikas on his shoes, and I never noticed this when I played it as a little kid and it's how normalized some things were in small spaces and how people just kind of glanced over and thought otherwise otherwise and like I'm not saying that everyone was wrong back then but things were thought of very differently than they were now and when we look back at them we kind of understand where we grew from this Mm -hmm. it, and it actually, kind of yeah it made me realize that not everyone is perfect and sometimes there is room for forgiveness and adjustment they have to be willing to accept that this was a different time I was wrong but I'm actively trying to fight against this mm -hmm. that's what happened with Susie and she used the Nazi imagery like way back then and completely did a 180 on that 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, there's there's totally a difference between someone who made a bad decision for a brief period of time and someone who continues to be a jackass like 40 years later, like Morrissey. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when I was at the castle last night, there's a guy wearing a giant pin that said free Morrissey on it with a picture of recent Morrissey. <laughs> I was like, dude, really? <laughs> That's what we're going to yeah. fight for right now? Ooh, you know what? That has always, that's now getting trends in our scenes because there's this Facebook group that I'm a part of, the 80s and 90s, uh, goth, synth, ethereal group. People always started posting stuff, making fun of Morrissey and his mm-hmm. fans have always came in with an ax handle with a, um, a battle ax ready to chop someone's head off. And it's like, you, you guys do realize this dude does does not necessarily care about inclusivity of that much unless it's earned, if you understand what I mean by him. Because he has pretty much made statements like, oh, in order to be a musician today, one has to be a black person because things are just handed to them rather than they have to work through a music industry that gets them hooked on drugs to continue producing music. What? Uh, Morrissey just a, a trash fire, just bad decisions. Oh, fuck! Hey. Another like topic is like all of these, like, god damn, like, like I'm thinking Danzig and the shit that he said lately. Yeah. Um, the shit that uh, what is his name? John Lydon, Johnny Rotten. Yeah. Has said it's just like when the hell did did like being uh you know like counter culture just turned into conservatism when they get rich and old <laughs> oh nina hagen yeah it's it's very shocking because maybe during this time period in the past we looked up to them because they were subversive they basically told our parents hey look your child is not an extension of you they're their own individual even though they're young it was always it was always the youth trying to gain independence even when the world told you you're too young you don't understand it's a lot more complicated there was always this rebellion and i thought shock rock and counterculture was supposed to be like yeah i talk about sex what's wrong like yeah i'm gonna do this what are you gonna do about it and i think a lot of people who became goths in during that time period of the 80s and 90s and like the late 70s, like I think they were, correct me if I'm wrong, battling the satanic panic and <laughs> all that all that period of parents just wanting to have a say in their child's life and saying, no, don't do this, no, don't do that. But turns out years later, they soon realized that yeah, I liked this person back then, but I don't like them now. That sort of mentality. I'm seeing that a lot now. Like Marilyn Manson? Yes. Everybody loved him in the 90s, but now they're they're taking their step, either stepping back or like one of my friends from my mom's church, who I'm really good with, who's like in the 80s and 90s goth. She's like, you know what? His girlfriend is a money-bagging hoe. Because she knew that uh, he was in a divorce and she actually sought out after him rather than seeking him after the divorce was finalized. And I'm like, yeah, a lot of people go chasing after people, but it's like maybe she fell into a situation that she bit off more than she can chew. Like, I, I don't know. And I'm, I always take the side of the victim until proven otherwise, but it's, It's just, you take a look at the situation and you, you're like, well, what's going on here? What happened? Who did this? Who did that? And it's, it's very strange. It's very murky because she brought up a point of what happened when he was touring with Twiggy and Twiggy's allegations and how Manson distanced himself from Twiggy. And I'm sitting here thinking in my head, he probably did it because it would affect the amount of money he is making. There's always a financial incentive. And 
And that kind of leads me to think about several things within the scene is, is there a financial incentive behind it? Or are they really doing this because they want their listeners to not be averted from an artist on their label or somebody in their scene? I don't know, is there money to be made in goth anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like $5 off an album on Bandcamp, maybe. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sure you've done better than that, Arthur. You've probably done like 10. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> like my, my charger. Yeah, because I think the generation that I think I'm being associated with is the Killstar generation, mm -hmm. which is like the fast fashion, the quick porcelain skin mm -hmm. um, aesthetic that is just basically exaggerated. Kind Instagram of, goths. Yeah, Instagram goths. No offense to everyone who has Instagram, which is all no, of us. You know what I mean by it's that. It's the, <laughs> the slim, hyper feminine, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Big like titty dark goth heroin GF. chic. Yeah. Like super perfect. And Arthur, that wasn't a dig at your music. $10 is rolling in goth money. <laughs> this is true. And it's like you see all these styles that are just popping up because of this like old fashioned community and you're you're just kind of taking it in like okay they're they're developing their own style they're doing their own thing and out of nowhere you get someone asking this question of oh can black people be goth and i'm like yeah they can i think i'm a definitive example of one but it's you're getting all these questions that normally would have, that you would have just said, yeah, duh, but it's sad that you're having to answer these questions and having to give someone reassurance. It's because it's the way goth is marketed. It's not yeah. marketed as inclusive or diverse um, on social media. And I would argue that there are definitely like clubs that you go out to or goth spaces that you go out to and you won't feel that way either um that it's particularly inclusive like when i first started clubbing i felt very self-conscious because all of the this is when i still identified as a woman all of the other women there were you know very slim and beautiful and i'm just like well that doesn't look like me yeah i felt i had the exact same problem back when i was a woman it was the same thing i was slimmer back then but i still didn't quite meet the image if that makes sense yeah. And another thing that I found out when getting into the whole fashion aspect of the subculture is a lot of clothes are cut really, they're cut really poorly for someone who is curvy or a little bit more mm -hmm. stocky. So it's like, come on, if you're catering to your market, don't you realize that there are people who are a little bit of different sizes and I'm not going to name names, but there's one brand who has very specifically said that they will never cater to larger sizes um, because it just doesn't look good and they don't want to see their styles on those bodies. And, I think I've seen that one. Yeah. And there um, are definitely um, problems with the fact that fast fashion is manufactured in China. They are cut to Asian sizes. Yes. Which yeah. not inherently a bad thing, but it doesn't necessarily meet what a lot of the like folks who would like to wear that fashion like how they're shaped and i think a lot of that tends to put a lot of stress on this individual i hear stories about people back in the day they used to have like eating disorders and left and right just trying to fit this style and i'm like if we're going to say that we built this subculture off of DIY, mm -hmm. then let's go back to that mindset of, if this does not fit me, let me find something that does and let me make it to where I like it. And just basically, if the clothes don't fit you, make some other clothes fit you. Or you and know, don't fit your personality to the clothes, fit the clothes to your personality. Exactly, like that. Yeah, I mean, and it goes even beyond um, uh, 
fashion. Like I also um, used to have this issue where I struggled with every time I'd get a tan, I would freak the fuck out and I'd get like scrubs and shit to try to get the tan off. And I'm already white. So <laughs> because, you know, you're supposed to be like, like bloated corpse, like at the bottom <laughs> of a lake white, you know? Mm hmm. <laughs> Anthony kind of touched on it too. I mean, he mentioned eating disorders and stuff and fitting the right size. I feel that a lot, even though I'm a man now, I still feel that kind of pressure in the goth scene to look like Peter Murphy with those like hollow cheekbones. And it's impossible to look like it is like rib cage. If you've ever seen that, it's impossible to maintain a healthy weight and look exactly like Peter Murphy. I mean, was yeah. he healthy? No, he was not healthy. The man was on all the drugs. Yeah. See, there you go. And now it's getting to him. It's catching back up. If you heard, he's infamous for throwing water bottles. Yep. And canceling twice on me on the Orlando show. Yep. Uh, Florida has kind of disowned him. I, I still love that twice, man, yeah. though. I, he is terrible, but I love him so much. Yeah. I think another person people love but they hate is, uh, what's his name? Andrew Eldridge. Yes. He hates being called goth, but I'm like, Every every artist and musician sounds like your music. Your music is enjoyed by this group of people. What do you expect? Yeah, it's just like embrace the hype guy. Like, mm -hmm. come on. No goth band wants to call that wants to be called goth. Like none of the big successful ones. Here, Susie, Sisters of Mercy, Bauhaus. They all want to say, "Oh no, I'm a rock band. I'm not goth." Because we're too cool for goth. <laughs> Was was um I, I I don't mean to date you, uh, J uh, Jesse and Robin, but was goth called goth when you got into the scene? It was definitely goth when I got into the scene, and now I feel like now the '90s were like the one time that goths knew what goth was, and were okay with calling themselves goth. Nailed it. I felt in the 2000s, the goths still didn't want to call themselves goths. <laughs> like if you went to the goth club and admitted you were a goth, they were like, poser. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Actually, don't you guys feel that over the last, mm, would you say five years? No, maybe less. Okay. Each one of you, how how recently do you feel people are comfortable saying I'm a goth? Like celebrating it, shouting it out to the rooftops. <laughs> what each of you, I'm just curious the timeline of that. Instagram, hashtagging. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That and um depends whether uh it's a fashion blog or whether they're the i'm um, sorry whether they're the the real deal or whether someone just trying to market themselves is that it really just depends but yeah i do see a lot of people now saying that like Part yeah I'm my a, uh, follow back strategy is or is this a god or an actual goth. <laughs> oh, is this a goth or a goth, 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 goth? Yeah, there we go. Same thing. <laughs> yeah. Are they more gothic than a graveyard? I guess it depends on the graveyard. And I call myself goth, and every day I worry that I'm not goth enough to use that label. Yeah, I could see myself saying that too. I felt that way when I was younger. I, I, I used to have a lot of insecurities when I was younger about... Um, like my goth identity and perceptions from like other people. And I found that I grew out of that. And I try like, I just assume that everybody goes through that. So I try to personally be sympathetic when I talk to people. <laughs> so I'm mm -hmm. just like, no, nah, like if, if you're feeling yeah. that way, I get it. Yeah. It's so I hard to pin down what is, sorry for interrupting it. Oh, no worries. Yeah, it's so hard to pin down what is goth and stuff. Like we've said this a million times, probably on the Obscure Undead channel, ask someone what goth music is and you'll get 5,000 different answers on that. So I make music and I'm a goth, but do I make goth music? I still haven't figured that out to this day. I mean, goth is a big umbrella. Also in terms of music creation, I think that genre is dead because no one just does a genre anymore. 
You just slap post-punk on it and call it a day. <laughs> yeah, except that's the thing. Post-punk doesn't mean avant-garde anymore. I wish it did. Then it might be more interesting. Post-punk and darkwave are abused adjectives for music these days. Yeah. Darkwave um, applies to so much, or is being used to refer to so much stuff that isn't actually darkwave now. And I'm like, yeah. what happened? Same as like death rock. I go on Bandcamp and I'm like, death rock! And it's all metal. And I'm like, come on, guys. What happened? What happened? And one of the things about getting into the music that I found was difficult is you have to develop an ear. And I'm like, I, I have to do all this extra work just to get some good music. Wow. Yes. Music is so hard. And, and that's the hardest thing I think that like I've had to tell people. They're just like, how do I tell if a song is goth? And the only, the best answer I can give them is just listen to a lot of it. Just feel it in your soul. If your soul says it's goth, then just ignore the rest. That's not good enough. <laughs> a lot of people say that for Taylor Swift. And people uh, say Taylor Swift is goth? What? Yes, they yeah. do. You'd be Absolutely. Surprised. Okay, then I take it back. Don't feel it in your soul. You're triggering me. <laughs> One good tip I'd give from someone who's uh, getting into music and getting into music production is listen for the guitars. Oh, no, I don't use any guitars. Well, not for making music, but like listening for it. Yeah, no, the guitars can be a dead giveaway. Guitars and vocal style. Yes, guitars and vocal style. Uh, bass is a little out there. Sometimes you get like a real funky bass. Sometimes you just get like a punk chug and you're just like, well, <laughs> it's a crapshoot, but it sounds great. But yeah, no, I agree on guitars. Yeah, and a good tip for Dark Wave is if it sounds like the guitar and the synthesizers are fighting each other for dominance. Think oh, of, Dark Wave has guitars though, huh? Yeah, Dark Wave has like gothic rock guitars as the chorus. And synthesizers right. is the like. But I don't think all dark wave. I, I I don't think guitars are necessary. This is just my personal opinion. I don't think guitars are necessarily required for dark wave. I think that a mm -hmm. lot of dark wave has guitars, but acapella dark wave. Consider that. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just no. <laughs> you don't want barbershop quartet goth. Wow, wow, wow. Only if it's for Brian Eno's. Doing... Okay, you know what? That would go hard. I that would, would be to great. That. Because then it's just going to be weird. Then there's the topic of ethereal wave. People are like, huh, what? I'm like, it is a genre. It's just like, imagine if Liz Taylor, <laughs> someone tried to sing like Liz Taylor, got halfway there. I mean, Liz Frazier, like Liz Frazier, excuse me. Liz Frazier or Lisa Gerard had someone play their guitar to sound like the Sisters of Mercy and had like whatever instruments they had just to make it sound like it came from another dimension, that sort of thing. Genuine question here. Are, um, are, do you find that like Gen Z are into ethereal wave? Yeah. Like big time or is it just kind of like some people? Yeah, big time. Because when I've interacted with some people in the, newer scene they're like oh my god i love ethereal but i can never find a lot of it and whenever i start the discussion of it it's like i don't even know what ethereal is what is it i mean some of the 90s goths i found had an idea of what it was they can name a few like lycia and um trying like to think anything of off project records yeah anything off project records uh test records <laughs> It's a great example of 90s ethereal wave. Who? Delirium. Delirium. Oh, oh I never heard of them. Bad. And it's like, I think the younger generation are more into melancholics and kind of like heavenly vocals that I think they're gravitating towards the genre and it's seeing a resurgence. Okay. Arthur just walked off into the forest. I love that. <laughs> Abby, um, I'm gonna have to jump off in about five. No, I was I was just thinking we've been going for about an hour and twenty minutes, and we should wrap up. It's just this. This is just such an easy, fun conversation. Sorry, I was getting more wine in the forest. <laughs> Watching you walk away. <laughs> it was very <laughs> interesting with your background. But we should like do this again, like maybe do a part two, if possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could do a part two and talk about genre. 
Hmm. I would love to absolutely, absolutely fail at that conversation. Oh. Let's just say we'll all fail, and which means we're all succeeding. It's participation trophies because no one has the answer. Yeah. No one wants to hear my hot take that my chemical romance is goth adjacent. That's what I'm a hard No participation trophy. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm curious to hear that one, how that one will go. <laughs> but my friend is an MCR fan and she probably might. If she does see this and here's the, the hot take on that one, she might go like, well, is it? She She's probably just gonna ask me a crap ton of questions, but it's all right. I don't have the answers to most of them, but we'll try. I think it would be fun to have a follow-up conversation on that if y'all are down for it, mm -hmm. because I think that it could yes. be civil and no one get mad. Maybe I'll intentionally get mad just to spice <laughs> things up. I'll throw a steel chair at somebody. No, just just go grab your mannequin and throw it across the room. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's over there. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, let's let's um, wrap this up. Arthur, Anthony, Jesse, Robin, thank you so much for doing this. Um, Jesse, thanks for thanks hosting. For Thanks for proposing the the topic and like working it out with me. Like this is this is fun. Thank you. Like Thank you. All right. Good and oh, oh, that's right. This is going to go up on YouTube. So to everyone watching, thank you for watching. Um but yeah, I'm going to get um oh wait, I need to do an outro. I'm not going to do an outro. I'm just going to wave bye. Bye. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you again next time.